Here they come, America. Soldiers in grease paint. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly a program of thanksgiving. It is a salute to the patriotic fervor of men and women from every branch of the theatrical profession who have done such a magnificent work entertaining the members of our armed forces both here and overseas. It is a humble acknowledgement of the ceaseless and untiring efforts of another group of self-effacing people, the workers who comprise USO Camp Shows, the organization that makes the wheels of a huge and complex machine run smoothly. In the next 45 minutes, you will hear from almost every corner of the globe. Washington, Guadalcanal, San Francisco, Panama. Here in our Hollywood studio is another battalion of soldiers in grease paint. There's Jack Benny, Judith Anderson, Francis Langford, Kay Francis, John Garfield. But to read the entire roster of names would deprive you of precious minutes of enjoyment. So let me turn the microphone over to a gentleman who will help manage the proceedings, your first host for this morning, Bob Hope. gentlemen, this is Bob saluting the USO Hope, a great movement that's lifting the morale of our boys, whether they're in Alaska, Australia, or Albuquerque, so they'll never feel like the part I get of the turkey. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's my opening smash. Well, I'm, I'm very proud to be on this show. I've just returned from a tour of the army camps in Europe to boost the morale of the soldiers in the United States. And I want, to, I want to say the USO sends actors to all the battlefronts. In fact, it's sort of a low circuit with foxholes. I had a... Uh, I had to bolster that a little, didn't I? I? I had a great time with the fellas over there. In fact, I still have a bad case of crap game knee. And I'll never forget the plane trip across the Atlantic. What thrills? You can take my pilot's word for it. He told me all about it when I came to in England. I really, I really wasn't scared. I read a good novel all the way across. On the way back, I read the second page. Not, I wasn't nervous, but I was shaking so hard the pilot cut out both motors and my knees kept the plane in the air. Halfway across, the stewardess tapped me on the shoulder and said, in case of trouble, the pilot is the last one to leave the plane. I said, why tell me? She said, well, I don't want to make you nervous, but there he is down there. <laughs> and what a time we had in London. The fog there isn't exactly thick, but I saw an air raid there one night and the anti-aircraft shot down three submarines. <laughs> Most of the time, you can't be sure whether it's fog or Churchill cigar, but we had a great trip. <laughs> but it's wonderful to come back to this country again, because you know that no matter how long you've been away, you'll see the same upraised arm... Heads! Who's that? <laughs> Is that my Crosley? What was that? <laughs> but it's great to get back, because no matter how long you've been away, you'll see the same upraised arm and the Statue of Liberty and the same face looking out of the White House window. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present a great guy, an up-and-coming young fellow who made a great name for himself on the dugout circuit, one of radio's foremost, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, say, that introduction was a little ambiguous, Bob. You said one of radio's foremost. Foremost what? Well, I cleaned up part of the speech, Jack. Oh, I see. <laughs> it originally said one of radio's four most obnoxious comedians. Oh, it did. Who are the other two? <laughs> well, now that, you the, now that you got the program started, Bob, might be wise to do a little entertaining. Yeah. Well, what'd you think I was doing out here, making an omelet? <laughs> I left myself wide open, didn't I? Yeah. Say, what's that thing under your arm? Did you just get through with the palladium, Jack? What is that there? Oh, this, no, I'm going to a wedding. This is um, a violin. This is a Steinway and Sons. <laughs> I'm going to play. Eggs. Well, yeah. you're going to play? Yeah. <laughs> this is no time to play the fiddle. Why, that's ridiculous. People always love to hear me play the violin. Look, I took it with me on my trip overseas, and I played it while we were making the flight from Cairo to Sicily in a bomber. I heard about that. It was the first time anybody was ever strafed by his own pilot. <laughs> Look, Bob, he wasn't aiming at me. My G-string was out of tune, and he thought we were being attacked by a Messerschmitt. 
Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Hoppy... Well, <clears throat> it isn't me, Jack. It's for your own good. What do you mean? Well, I don't think it would be wise for you to play the fiddle at all today. You see, in a few minutes, we're going to listen to Heifetz. I didn't catch the name? <laughs> Heifetz. He's in Panama, and we're soon going to switch the program there. Heifetz. Mm -hmm. Panama. That isn't the little fellow with the hat store there, is it? <laughs> No, that's the little fellow with the fiddle, Yasha Heifetz. He plays the violin, and he's in Panama. Yasha Hi... Oh, of course. I remember seeing him in a nightclub there. Yasha Heifetz and his Panamaniacs. <laughs> Great band. No, he doesn't no. play with a band. He's the Sinatra of the cat gut. Look, the oh. word is... <laughs> not... <laughs> it's not... Panamaniacs, anyway. The word is Panamanians. Look, Bob, I know what the word is, and I know who Heifetz is, too, but I don't see how my playing will conflict with his at all. Our techniques are totally different. Yeah, he only has to put it under one chin. Yeah. <laughs> I use my second chin for a mute. <laughs> If you'll be good enough to carry on for a few seconds, Bob, I'll get some rosin for my bow. Get an axe for or your that fiddle, resin. too. Oh, <laughs> what? Don't talk through my slug, please. <laughs> get your big galot. Where's that? Quick, oh, let's quick, try quick. it with strings this time. Jack, since you're not going to give me a straight line. No. Jack, since you're so anxious to play, you'd better have the full advantage of the acoustics in this studio. If you'll just go behind the screen... Me behind the screen? Believe me, Jack, it's safer. Besides, we've fixed up a very delicate microphone for you. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Bob. Oh, think nothing the of it. The acoustics are important, I yes. imagine. Now, see, now, where did I put my rod? <laughs> are you ready, Jack? Yeah, okay. Start playing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the finest excuse anybody ever had to switch a program. Even if Benny wasn't playing, I'd be delighted to announce that you're going to listen to Al Jolson in New York. Take it away, New York. Who has entertained our boys on more fighting fronts than any other soldier in Greece paint. He's making his first appearance since recovering from a very serious illness. Al, what were the favorite songs that the boys asked you to sing abroad? Well, in Sicily and in Italy and in Africa, England, Ireland, Alaska... Mammy and Sonny Boy were probably the favorite songs. I, of course. I <laughs> sung them so much, honestly. If the boys didn't get sick of them, I did. <laughs> so, since I've been back, I've seen one show and I heard a great song. Uh, I think it's the greatest song I've heard in years. Of course, everybody knows the song. Maybe the boys haven't heard it yet over there. Will you sing it now? Well, I sing it. I don't want to tell you the name of it because the minute I do it, everybody will know what it is and probably tune out. So, if you don't mind, <laughs> Brother Miller, will you play Take It? <laughs> Don't throw bouquets at me Don't please my folks too much Don't laugh at my jokes too much People will say we're in love Don't sigh and a gaze at me Your sighs Are so like mine Your eyes Mustn't glow like mine People will say We're in love Don't start Collecting things Give me my rose and my glove. Sweetheart, they're suspecting things. People will say we're in love. Don't dance all night with me till the stars fade. From above, they'll see it's all right with me. People will say we're in love. Ah, uh, thank. 
Thanks very much, Al. And now, ladies and gentlemen, another very fine soldier in grease paint speaking to us from way across the sea. Your old friend, Frederick March. Take it away, Cairo. Man, for the first time, have had ample opportunity to compare these lands with home. To compare standards of living, food, sanitation, and from every angle. And they are utterly convinced, perhaps at long last, that they are fighting for the finest country in the world. Another thing the boys are thankful for is that they occasionally get a fairly new moving picture. But it is much too seldom. Once or twice they have had a first showing, that is the world premiere of a film. This was in the Central Africa area. And they were thrilled and grateful. They can't understand why they should be shown so often movies which many of them saw at home two or three years ago. And I can understand why every movie that now comes out of Hollywood should not be shown first of all and immediately to the armed forces overseas. Or at least let the boys here see them at the same time they are shown at home. I assure you it would build morale tremendously. But even more important than movies as a morale factor is mail. We have so little conception at home of how extremely important it is to the boys. They want more and more mail and news from home. Several commanding officers have told me that if, if it ever happened that their men were without mail from home for three consecutive months, they could not possibly be responsible for anything their men might do. Mail is usually rated as second in importance to food as regards morale. But many boys that I have talked to claim it is even more important than food. Always remember that morale overseas is spelled M-A-I-L. A Thanksgiving letter from you today and every day will make some soldier thankful and grateful, I assure you. In closing, may I say in all sincerity, I believe there is nothing the citizenry of America could be called upon to do in the way of sacrifices that would make up for what these boys are doing for you. Thank you, Frederick Marsh. Take it away, New York. Bob. Oh, magnificent, Jack. I'm sure our listeners never enjoyed your fiddle as much as they did this morning. Oh, it was nothing, nothing. And Bob, it was really sweet of you. I mean, asked me to play 12 encores. Would you believe it? I wasn't even conscious that an audience was listening to me. You have no idea how it helped. <laughs> you know, only one thing bothered me, Bob, from a musician's standpoint. I mean, you know how fussy I am about perfection. But when I reach the legato passage of Love and Bloom... Yes. Well, I'm afraid I put too much bravura in the tremolo, and I think I loused up the andante. <laughs> Do you think anybody noticed it? Nobody, Jack. Not a soul. That relieves me. Jack, I've got a confession to make. When you started playing, we switched to New York. You switched to New York? You mean you cut me off the air? Well, we only stayed in New York two minutes. Oh, only two minutes. Then you switch back to me. Hmm? Well, not right away. From New York, we switched to Cairo. Cairo. Oh, then, then you came back to me. Then you came back to me? <laughs> then you didn't come back to me? It's about all you can do with that line, anyway. I was going, <laughs> I was going no, on Jack. to my Sunday broadcast with that one. No, Jack, we didn't come back. Well, Bob, what part of my violin solo came over the air? The part where you loused, loused up, up the, the undying. Undying. Yeah. <laughs> Well, of all the dirty tricks, what was so important that you had to cut me off to switch to Cairo in New York? You well, know? there was artist, Frederick Marsh. I know and... he's good, but is he so good that I should be sacrificed? I'd understand it. You know, I don't, if you cut me off the air to hear somebody like Al Jolson, the world's greatest entertainer, but... Jack, when we switched to New York, we picked up Al Jolson. Him I can't stand at all. <laughs> With your legs, you're lucky you can stand. <laughs> Listen to Charles Atlas. Over here. Look, Hope, I'm going to play right now, and everybody's going to hear me. You understand? Well, if you must, Jack, go behind the screen again. All right. I never heard of such... Are you ready, Jack? Yeah, just a second. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to bring you Brigadier General Joseph W. Byron, Director of Special Services, Army Service Forces. General Byron will speak to you from San Francisco. Take it away, San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco. We are again on the road to see if our 45 USO shows are keeping up the good work. My boss, Joe Dokes, and I say to you, good troopers, well done. We thank you. And to you, Joe Dokes, wherever you are, we troopers, we old soldiers, we grandfathers, we of the nation, want you to know on this day of thanks, we are grateful to you and for you. And we pledge on our honor to do our best to do our duty to God and our country and to help you at all times. Take it away, Hollywood. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful, Jack. Well, it felt better. I didn't make any mistakes at all that time. Not, not one. <laughs> See, listen, I'd like to hear that violin solo mine. Did they make a recording of it? I... Yes, they did, but uh, something went wrong with the recording outfit here, and they had to cut the record in Panama. In Panama? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll sound good, though. Would you like me to switch into Panama and have them play it back for you? Well, if it isn't too much trouble. Oh, uh... not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, we... Oh, Jack, if you go behind the screen again, you'll find the reception much clearer. Oh, thanks. Yeah, but it'll sound pretty good coming all the way from <laughs> <Yes>. Panama. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now to Panama, where Yasha Heifetz is waiting to delight you with the magic music of his violin. Take it away, Panama. Ah. we have just presented a portion of the concert being given this morning by Yasha Heifetz, accompanied by Emmanuel Bay before an audience of Uncle Sam's fighting men. This is Captain Phil Lampkin speaking. Take it away, Hollywood. Wasn't that marvelous, folks? Did you ever hear such masterful playing? Hey, my record really sounded good, didn't it, Bob? Good. Nobody can play like that. Yeah, I could hardly believe it was me. I'll have to get that record. I'll see you soon, Bob. Okay, Jack. How can a man make a censored word out of himself like that? <laughs> well, according to my notes, it's time to bring on a few more soldiers in grease paint, and here is a feminine task force who entertained not only our boys overseas, but also appeared before Queen Elizabeth and the royal family. Led by the lovely Kay Francis, they did a bang-up job, and here she is to present them, Kay Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now... Now, all I can say is that, well, we had a wonderful time. And you'll hear our story in song from Martha Ray, Carol Landis, and Mitzi Mayfair. Girls, if you please. We shall not forget the buddies that we met Sunday, Monday, and always We wore G.I. boots And long-drawered union suits Sunday, Monday And always We missed that sandy bed So snug to sleep at night We missed those itsy-bitsy fleas And flies that bite and bite 
A hair done in the mood A helmet for a snood Sunday, Monday, and always We were gaining weight Beans were all we ate Sunday, Monday, and always Out of bed we'd roll Then bathe in a bowl Sunday, Monday, and always We knew the boys would meet and greet us like a pal We brought the very thing they needed for morale A gal So to those fighting men We would go again Sunday, Monday, and always they wonderful? And now to show you that we cover every field of entertainment from Joe Miller to Shakespeare, I'm proud to say that we have with us today one of America's most outstanding dramatic actresses. She's a real soldier in grease paint too and was the first Hollywood representative to play for our men in the South Pacific, introducing Miss Judith Anderson. Most of you men who are listening to this Thanksgiving Day broadcast are far away from home. Many of you have not seen your wives or sweethearts, your mothers or sisters for months, or perhaps for years. War is violent and brutal. And perhaps some of you find it hard to believe that there's still kindness, gentleness, and love left in this world. But we women have not forgotten. We women, and I mean your wives, sisters, mothers, and sweethearts, are waiting. And we will always wait until you return. But in the meantime, in our small way, we are doing what we can to shorten this war. We buy bonds, help with the Red Cross and USO, or we take over a man's job so that there still will be one more soldier to help you win this war. And every night we pray for your safe return. This is Thanksgiving Day. I hope that next Thanksgiving Day we will be together again in our own homes. And when peace comes to us and we relight our torch of freedom, dear God, with your help and guidance, we will never again let it go out. God bless you all. Thank you, Miss Anderson. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, we switch once again to overseas. This time, the place is Guadalcanal, and the trooper is Jackie Heller. Take it away, Guadalcanal. This is your NBC News reporter, George Thomas Bolster, speaking from New California. Join us for the next couple of minutes while we tell you about the grandest bunch of fellows in the world, your sons, sweethearts, husbands, and brothers. We're happy to present a stay, style of stage, screen, and radio. Known to you as 61 inches of song, little Jack Heller. Thanks, George, and hi, and Mr. and Mrs. America. Where do you hear from, Jackie? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, you're a long way from a beaten path. And what are you doing in this part of the world? Well, George, I'm proud to say that I'm here with a USO overseas camp show. And with two other entertainers, Lou Parker and George Funkelberg. We're having a swell time doing shows for these boys who need and deserve them so much. And how long have you fellows been out with them? Well, about seven months. You expect to be around much longer? George, as long as there are troops to entertain, the sky's the limit. And to date, Jackie, uh, where have you been? Well, the Hawaiian Islands, New Caledonia, Esperito Santos, and Guadalcanal. And how do you like doing one night in the South Pacific? <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful. A bit rough at times, but after we do our shows and see the boys laugh, yell, and just about tear down the house as the saying goes, we realize that our work is not in vain. For the hour and 20 minutes we're singing and playing, we know we're giving them a little pleasure and enjoyment and bringing home a little closer to them. In fact, 
I often think that the men are the actors because whether it was a torrential rain, storm, or a very hot day, the show just had to go on. I know that you've had many experiences while touring here in the South Pacific, Jackie. I really have, George, but the biggest thrill I've had so far was when I was asked to join the men in their Yom Kippur services in Esperito Santos. Seeing him for the first time since leaving my father's prayer many years ago brought back many memories. Believe me, it was a great thrill singing for and with the men. That's a very last question. How do you find the morale of our fighting men out here? Morale, did you say? Out here in the South Pacific, morale isn't mentioned. It's here, there, and everywhere. It's the way the men talk, eat, sleep, and play. In fact, it's everything they do. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me when I tell you that the shows presented by the USO camp shows have aided immensely in maintaining the spirit. And your loved ones, uh, they're the greatest and most appreciative audience in the world. And now on behalf of George Finkelberg, Lou Parker, my manager, Lieutenant Denison, George Bolster, and yours truly, here's wishing you the happiest Thanksgiving Day ever. Thank you, Jackie Heller. Take it away, Hollywood. <laughs> We pause briefly for station identification. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue with Soldiers in Grease Paint from Hollywood. And now I'd like to present one of Hollywood's most charming stars, the lady who was one of the original overseas gals, that beautiful English actress, Merle Oberon. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Merle. You're a regular paper doll, aren't you, huh? Mind if I put my arm around you? Do you put your arms around all the paper dolls? Yeah, I'm from the Associated Press. <laughs> Merle, I understand you recently finished a tour of the army camps in England. Yes, Bob. I toured the camps with Al Jolson. You know him, don't you? Oh, yes. I know Al Jolson very well. We were in vaudeville together. Really? Yeah, before he sang, I used to run out and spread a doily under his knee. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you recently got back yourself from England, didn't you? Yes, Merle. I must say I created a sensation when I appeared at Buckingham Palace. Oh, yes, I heard you did. Bob, you know, you're supposed to wear silk knee breeches when you appear before the king. You're supposed to wear silk knee breeches? That's right. You're not supposed to walk in with just your long underwear pulled up tight. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, wasn't it thrilling to see the British and American boys sharing everything? Even the same reading room in the canteen. Yeah, but our boys have one bad habit. They cut pages out of the magazines. They do? Sure, in fact, for six months, the British thought Esquire was a magazine about what the men are wearing. <laughs> Bob, were you frightened during the air raids? Oh, I don't know that I was any more afraid of the air raids than anyone else. After all, I saw plenty of big, tough soldiers kneeling beside their beds. Yes, I know, but they at least got up once in a while to go and eat. <laughs> Merle, I wasn't afraid of those enemy bombers. I don't know, Bob, but you were the only man in London who shaved the top of his head and had Open City tattooed on his skull. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure they'd see the white flag hanging on my nose. <laughs> but I enjoyed playing those army camps, Bob, especially when the soldiers started giving me that old G.I. look. G.I. look? Yes, that means it's my Jeep, baby. Get in. <laughs> yeah, those boys really know how to take a curve Say, listen, I'm a... And I'm sure that you were a welcome hitchhiker, Merle Thank you, Bob And before I go, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you boys Not to lose your G.I. look Because I'll be seeing you again soon Thank you, Merle Oberon. And now another USO star who toured Alaska and the Aleutians, our old friend, Senor Professor Jerry Colonna. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Professor Colonna. Good morning. Morning? Is that what that stuff is out there? <laughs> you look grand. Look at that stash. It's good today, isn't it? Yes. Only man in the world can kiss a girl and give her the brush off at the same time. <laughs> Professor, we had a lot of fun up there in Alaska, didn't we? Yes, indeed, we did. But one thing I want to know, Cologne, about that Alaskan trip, why were you always hollering, mush, mush? Oh, they made me wait for my breakfast. 
Not this morning, though. I was too early for it. Yeah, get in line. (laughs) Say, when we came down through Alaska, did you notice those mounted policemen? Oh, they're nothing. No hope. I was a mounted policeman before I was born. You were a mounted policeman before you were born? How is that possible? I lied about my age. (laughs) You know, Professor, you've got the lowest IQ I ever saw. I can't help it. My suspenders are loose. (laughs) You know, you give me the willies. Okay, but I'll have to take the tires off at first. (laughs) Tell me. Tell me, Professor. Yes? Did you like Alaska? Ah, yes. Wonderful place, Alaska. You know, Hope, I followed the Alaskan customs easily. I got so that I even tried whale meat. Yes, I know. I saw you one night struggling with that big hunk of blubber. (laughs) Sir, you are speaking of the woman I love. (laughs) So you had a lot of fun up there, huh? Ah, yes. The first day I was in Alaska, I met a lovely girl, and I sure enjoyed kissing her. Even if she had a funny snout and dark, glistening skin and two long teeth sticking out of her mouth. (laughs) Colonna, you fool, that was a walrus you kissed. A walrus? Gad, so that explains why your mustache was longer than mine. <laughs> Marvelous, Jerry. Go back and stick your head back in the icebox. And now to Washington, D.C., and Rear Admiral Louis E. Dunfeld, Acting Chief of Naval Personnel. Take it away, Washington. Washington. In October of 1941 the War and Navy Departments jointly requested the organization of Camp Shows Incorporated in its present form. Since that time, many thousands, even millions, of naval personnel, including the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard, have been privileged to hear the entertainers who are so so familiar to the American radio audience. Realization of the privilege has helped to maintain the ties with home which naval personnel place so highly in rating the assets of life in a democracy. These entertainers whom you hear on this program have been to the far corners of the earth for the sole purpose of bringing joy to the hearts of men whose lives are otherwise filled with the reminders of war. In addition, many who cannot appear on this program have given their services. These services have been contributed gratis when the individual could afford to do so. But gratis or not, the same generous spirit has been common to all. The entire entertainment world of radio, stage, and screen has combined to contribute its bit to reminding the service man or woman that the American people are grateful for the service he or she is performing. In the background of this picture, but essential part thereof, are the musicians, the writers, the stage hands, the costume designers, and the many other unseen workers who contribute to make camp shows the great success that it is. The entertainment varies from the one-man show to a fair-sized company, and all are received with enthusiasm at home and abroad. These groups are being maintained in spite of the demands which war makes on the manpower of the entertainment world as well, as well as on all other professions. The entertainers and workers deserve the gratitude of the Navy, and it is my pleasure to extend to them and to camp shows on this Thanksgiving Day the thanks of every man and woman who wears the uniform of the United States Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. Thank you, Admiral Denfell. Take it away, Hollywood. To the stirring rhythm of the military drums marches yet another squad of soldiers in grease paint. As they approach, we can make out the rollicking features of Andy Devine, the elfin smile of Jimmy Burke, and the lovely, lively figures of Jinx Falkenberg and Faye McKenzie. Here, indeed, is a detail of veteran entertainers who have brought joy and spiritual comfort into the hearts of our boys everywhere. Listen. Detail! Help! <clears throat> Miss Falkenberg, Miss McKenzie, Jim Burke, I hold in my hand a citation. Citation for each of you for your work in the Army Camps of America and your appearances in the war zones overseas. 
Miss McKenzie. Thank you, Andy. Although I'm sure I don't know what we've done to deserve any citations. Do you, Jinx? On the contrary, Faye. I think we owe a lot of people a debt of gratitude. Sure, I never thought I'd get to make a free trip around the world. And no trouble with the custom officials, either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, since you're backing away from the limelight, let's all step back a little further and throw a handful of credit at the people who make these tours possible. Nothing at all could happen without the full, generous cooperation of the Special Service Division of the United States Army and Navy Department. Thanks to these hard-working battalions of true soldiers, our jobs have been made not only easier, but a real pleasure. Because of their ever-guarding presence, none of us has ever for a moment become conscious of any danger or hazard. And when you think of what our fighting men go through, well, I'm almost ashamed to say that none of us have ever been inconvenienced. So I suggest that these citations be turned back to where they rightfully belong, the Special Service Division of the United States Army and Navy Department. What do you say, soldiers? I'm in favor. You beat me to it, Faye. I'll buy some of that, too, Andy. Good. Now let's all go down to headquarters and see what they've got lined up for our next trip. Tension! Fight! Fight! We salute you, Andy Devine, Jim Burke, Jinx Falkenberg, and Faye McKenzie. And now here he is, Jack Benny once again. Ladies and gentlemen, on my trip overseas, I have the good fortune to be accompanied by one of the sweetest persons in the industry. They ever hand out medals for good trooping, wonderful entertaining, and plain downright loveliness. My nomination goes to the charming Anna Lee. Anna, will you step up here, please? Thank you. And, Jack, that was as beautiful a compliment as I ever hoped to hear. Well, I meant it sincerely. Folks, uh, Miss Lee has the distinction of being the only Hollywood star to play a return engagement in the Sicilian theater of war. May I say, Jack, that I don't consider it a distinction at all. I think it's a privilege. Oh, Jack, there's a friend of mine here in the studio, and I'd like the pleasure of introducing him. It says here, pray do. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, all my friends over there, here is a young artist whose work overseas will live long in the memory of servicemen, Mr. John Garfield. Thank you, Anna. I uh, ran across a rather moving piece written for Variety by Joe Schoenfeld, which sums up completely the way we actors feel about each other and the small contribution we make to the men who are fighting our battles. With your permission, may I read it? I'd love to hear it, John. I am the spirit of all actors. My name might be Jolson or Brown, Francis or Ray, Benny or Hope, Cantor or Landis, Tony Romano, Kelly or Adler, Grace Drysdale. My name is Carol Lombard, Roy Rogman, Tamara. I'm an acrobat a singer, a comedian, a dancer, and a tragedian. I'm the soubrette, the ingenue, the juvenile, the leading man. I'm the modest performer, and I'm the star. At this moment, I'm playing in a tin hut somewhere in Alaska, a camp in Australia, a makeshift theater in the Caribbean. I'm slogging through mud in North Africa. I'm in the Solomons, in Ireland, in England, in Iceland, wherever there's an American soldier, sailor, or Marine. Let no cloistered thoughts mourn for me. I am a living spirit. It is not for tears that I serve my country. That is my duty and heritage. If I persuade a man to buy his limit in war bonds, if I inspire a worker to quicken his lath, if I brighten the lot of a lonely soldier, then these are my contributions to an America at war. It would be cause for lament only if my efforts failed. For this work, I ask no plaudits, no eulogies. I am a soldier in grease paint, serving a free country and freedom-loving men. This service is the actor's imperishable memorial. (laughs) 
Beautifully done, John. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce a gal who has really done a tremendous do- a job. A girl that got the thrill of her life entertaining our boys in Alaska, the Aleutians, England, Africa, and Sicily, and I know she thrilled them too, Miss Frances Langford. Thank you, Bob. It was a wonderful experience, wasn't it? And gee, wasn't it thrilling when we first touched American soil again? President Roosevelt himself was at LaGuardia Airport when we landed. Yeah, he watched everybody get out of the plane, and he said, I'll have to do the cooking for a few days more. She must still be in Australia. (laughs) Oh, I thought England was wonderful. You were born over there, weren't you, Bob? Yes, Francis, and right in my old neighborhood, the Luttwaffe, we dropped tons and tons of bombs. But the house I was born in is still standing up. Isn't that a miracle? No, if it stood up under what the stork dropped, it can stand up under anything. <laughs> Thank you, Francis Langford. Well, that just about brings us to the bottom of the page, folks. I think you all understand the purpose of this program, and I'm sure you'll all respond very generously. Uh, Bob, before we tie this thing up, I want to say something publicly that I've been saying privately for a long time. Well, what is it, Jack? Well, I think if our servicemen took a vote, you'd be elected as the man who has brought them more laughter and joy than anybody else. That's all. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Jack, I'll treasure that statement as long as I live. Coming from a man who not only has no peer in the entertainment world, but a man who slogged his way through tough terrain doing as many as five and six shows a day for our boys, no matter where they were. But you know, Jack, if everybody at home just kicks in a little harder to the National War Fund, lots more fellas and girls can go over and make them really happy. Well, don't worry, Bob. They'll kick in. Well, I'll be running along. Got to start working on my program for Sunday. Yeah, well, I'm going back to bed, too. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we wish to thank the Hollywood Victory Committee, which made possible the appearance of the stars, both from Hollywood and from overseas. We also wish to express our gratitude to the United Theatrical War Activities Committee. The orchestra was under the direction of Thomas Peluso, and the entire program was under the supervision of Phil Rapp and produced by Bob Seal. Soldiers in Grease Paint has been a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and came to you from Panama, Washington, Cairo, San Francisco, New Caledonia, New York, and Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.